those people who, uh, who don't know who, who Kate Bush is and completely forgotten who she may have been, she is the, um, the waif-like singer and songwriter who had an enormous hit with her first eerie single, Wuthering Heights. Out on the windy, windy moors, we'd roll and fall in green. She was an original, a rarity in the pop world where so many performers look and sound much the same. She sang the Bird. Is it a plane? Is it a tree? No, 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 it's a bush. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Kate Bush. Kate Bush. Kate Bush. It's just like fire, you know? It's all just like coming out of her mouth. She has made her performances into something of an art form, mingling dance and mime and all kinds of theatre. I mean, they're not normal songs. None of her songs have been normal. I see the people watching. She's just who she is. She's unique. She's a mystery. She's the most beautiful mystery. There were moments of, like, hairbrushing the mirror, you know, <laughs> like running up that hill and dancing around the lounge. I mean, the music speaks for itself, but liking her makes you feel a bit clever. <laughs> Hours have been in my room by myself through good times and bad times and listen to her on headphones and her taking me away from my stress. Let me tell you a story. When I had my civil partnership um, nine years ago in 2005, and Kate, we invited Kate. We didn't think she'd come, but she did. Came with her husband, Danny. And there were a lot of very famous people in that room. There was like 600 people. And all anybody wanted to meet was Kate Bush. I mean, musicians, anybody. They couldn't believe Kate Bush was there. She's kind of an enigma. I don't think she's ever particularly wanted to play the game, has she? But I think when you... When you've done great work like she's done, and then you retract from the public, people almost have to make up their own version of you, don't they? You can hear one note of a Kate Bush song, or one note of her voice even, and, and know immediately what it is. And that is the biggest feat of any artist, especially when you consider you know, all the roads that she's gone down. When Kate Bush came along, sort of 78, I was in the slits and I remember I was sitting in a van outside our singer's house waiting to go and do a gig and um, Wuthering Heights came on the radio and I was like, huh? what? what's this? And I kept waiting for the melody to repeat because, you know, at that time pop music was very much Radio 1, you know, was repeating melodies very quickly and this melody sort of meandered on in this high-pitched voice warbling and dropping but I was absolutely spellbound. When I first heard it, I thought that was extremely challenging, the vocal. Uh, it was almost hysterical uh, and so up there, the, the register. But it was absolutely fascinating and I know at the time a lot of my friends couldn't bear it. I just thought that was just too much, but that's exactly what drew me in. Bad dreams in the night. You told me I was going to lose the facts. Be behind my walk good, walk good, walk good, the high teeth. Look, I can see withering lights. Well, I saw a series on the television. About ten years ago, um, it was on very late at night, and I caught literally the last five minutes of the series where she was at the window trying to get in. Who are you? I'm Catherine Linton. I've come home. And it just really struck me. It was so strong. And you, I read the book. You read the book, <laughs> you read the book later? Yeah, I read the book before I wrote the song because I needed to get the mood properly. I'd never heard anything like it before. It was like banshee music. This absolute otherworldly voice singing about a book. 
And as a bookish kid, I was always fascinated by anything, any music that seems to be about or inspired by books. For that to have come out of someone's brain, period, is a remarkable feat. For that to have come out of someone's brain at 17 years old, this incredible song, incredible song. There aren't that many amazing pop songs that have two or three key changes in them. And I'm not talking like modulations, I'm talking like, okay, now we're in the key of Q. You know, it's like, what? But it's, but it's so brilliant, it's so memorable. I always karaoke that song if I drink enough. Wuthering Heights was not your normal type song. Um, but that's why it was so brilliant. It was great to hear something out of the norm. You know, when things like that come along, they don't come along very often. I mean, when does the next Kate Bush come along after Kate Bush? There hasn't been one. Now let's get back to the beginnings. You're, you're 19 now. 20. 20. Yeah, just. And you're from Kent. Yeah. And uh, is Kate Bush your own name? Yes, she is. Now, your father's a doctor. Yes. Is it a musical family? Uh, my brothers are very musical, yeah. They were really responsible for turning me onto it in the first place. Mm. They were always playing music when I was a kid. Her brothers were a big part of it. They were very much, in, the, in her early days, their formative years, particularly people like Paddy. I mean, he was, he was having all these musical ideas coming in. He had all these strange musical things that he was into, you know, lots of strange musical instruments and, and various forms of music, and he would run those past her, and lots of it would stick, you know. What do you call it? It's called uh, Astramento de Porco. That's its, its real name. You're Kate's brother, aren't oh, yeah, you? Yeah, afraid so. Is it sort of a bit of a family business, really? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, like, Kate and I have been making music together for years and years, on different levels, you know, but, I mean, there's always been music in our family. Well, when I was young, it was really the music that my brothers played, um, and I'd pick out the stuff that I liked to listen to it with them. And, what, what kind of music they played? Uh, they were into King Crimson at that time, and Pink Floyd, and Blind Faith. Fleetwood Mac, that sort of thing. When you went to visit the family house, you know, East Wickham, you know, it was a, it sort of reminded me of my parents' house in some ways. It was a, it was a comfortable middle class doctor's house with a nice garden. Yet out of that had grown this strange creature that uh, was doing wonderful things. When did you start writing songs? I must have been 11 or 12. Well, when did the music man come to hear about you? And how? Uh, that was quite a gradual process. Um, when I was about 14, there was a friend of my brother's called Ricky Hopper who um, was in the business and he knew a lot of people and he acted as a, a friend to try and get the tapes across to people. Um, and after some trying, there was no response. And he knew Dave Gilmore from the Pink Floyd. And um, Dave came along to hear me because at that time he was scouting for struggling artists. I had a listen. I was intrigued by this strange voice. I went to her house, met her parents down in Kent, and she played me, God, I mean, it must have been 40 or 50 songs um, on tape. And I thought I should try and do something. Dave Gilmore put up the money for me to make a proper demo with arrangements and selected songs, and we took it to the company. We were making um, Pink Floyd, that is, were making uh, the Wish You Were Here album, and I think we had the record company people down at Abbey Road in number three. And suddenly I find myself. And um, I said to them, Do you want to hear something I've got? 
And they said, sure. So we found another room and I played it to them. The man with the child in his eyes. And they said, yep, thank you, we'll have it. <laughs> He's here again. The man with the child in his eyes. He's here again. You know, man with the child in his eyes is still one of those things that, right from the get-go, you know, has a has its own life because it's just a great song. And she has, you know, for all the time that she or I or anyone spend decorating and creating moods, it's actually the key element of what you're saying, the melody and the chords and the rhythm that still speak louder than all the stuff around on a great song. It is absolutely beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> and it's uh, it's sort of over two years before any of the other recordings she did. That is her singing at the age of 16 and having written those extraordinary lyrics about uh, whatever they're about. The thing is with me, I only like extreme talent. That's the only thing I can listen to. And I like originators. Where does Kate Bush come from? You can't hear her influences. You know, it's like um, Billie Holiday. When I first heard Billie Holiday, I never heard anything like that in my life. The same with Kate Bush. I can't figure out musically, artistically, who her mother and father is. <laughs> Somebody told me that she was at the 73 gig at Ziggy Sardis. I'm like, are you sure? Everybody seems to be in at that gig. Yeah, we were there. It's, it's a great gig. He's, he's one of those people that have had an influence on her in, in a weird sort of way, you know. It's not obvious, but, you know, people do. She was aware of Roxy Music, Brian Eno, people like that. You know, she's aware of a lot of people. A lot of people had a, an influence on her. Kate, having seen me probably, well, yeah, the first time working with Bowie, I mean, she wanted to be a performer like that. I'm not saying like, like Bowie, but to, to move like, like, like that. And, of course, she had seen flowers, as did everyone at that time. I went to see a, a show, and it was Lindsay Kemp. And mm -hmm. uh, really, I'd never seen anything like it before. And what he was doing was he was using movement without any sound at all, something I'd never experienced. And he was expressing so much, probably more, than most people would express with their mouths. And it suddenly dawned on me that there was a whole new world of expression that I hadn't even realised. I was teaching at the dance centre in Covent Garden. Kate turned up, dressed very properly in her ballet tights and things, and her hair scraped back, looking very, very professional indeed, very, very serious student, but as timid as hell. And, of course, she took a place at the back of the class. You know, I had to coax her forward. I mean, she was extremely shy, extremely timid. And, of course, the first thing I had to do was, you know, uh, bring her out of herself, give her courage. I have to say that, uh, that once Kate actually started dancing, she was a wild thing. I mean, she was wild. One day, some months after knowing her, I got back to my, my home in Battersea, and there was a, an LP pushed under the door the kick inside, and there dedicated to me was this beautiful song, Moving. How I move, how you move me, with your beauty's potency. I didn't know uh, she 
had any aspirations to being a singer. She never talked about herself. I met her for the first time in the spring of 77. And we went around to her brother's house uh, to meet her because we were put, we wanted to get a band together to do some pubs. And the idea was we'd get his sister to sing because we might be able to get a few more gigs if we had a, a girl singer, you know. And so we, you know, we got that band together. We had a few rehearsals. We did lots of covers, but we did things like James and the Cold Gun, Heavy People, and all that kind of stuff. We did embryonic versions of those. First time you sang in public, do you remember that? Yeah, that was about two years ago in a pub in Lewisham. <laughs> and I was so scared, I really was. And I knew from day one, I knew that she, there was no way this girl's not going to make it. She's going to be a huge success, you know. There's no way, because she was, she was so driven for it and, and her enthusiasm for it all, it was infectious, you know. <laughs> Now we have uh, a young person, uh, Basil Bush's uh, sister, who, as you know, was uh, responsible for that uh, great hit, uh, Withering Tights. Kate Bush and the Bushwhackers. Rolling the ball, rolling the ball, rolling the ball to me. The early vocal style is really acrobatic, isn't it? And it's kind of like, it's very, almost sort of... <laughs> vocal gymnastics, isn't it? Jumping around all over the place. She's almost still finding her, finding her style a little bit. It's quite kooky and strange. When I first started singing, I had an incredibly plain voice. I mean, I could sing in tune, but that was about mm. it. I mean, mm. I really wasn't that good. Um, and really all I did was uh, sing every day because I was writing songs, I would sing them. Um, I was concentrating much more on my writing and therefore my voice came through that. You can sort of understand the experimentation of her music through thinking about what she does with her voice. And she uses it as a kind of fabric to sort of pull and push and almost tear apart. And she's sort of stretching the fabric not just of her voice, but of the whole kind of pop form, I think. There are lots of layers to that song, but what she's doing with her voice is just going, wow, wow, wow. It's very hypnotic. It's, it's a bit like a siren, and then, you know, she, it whoops up to a very high register. It's like a child. It's, it's like a kind of just reveling in what her voice can do. We're all alone on the stage tonight. It's sort of about her own melodrama, isn't it? About the, about the actor, about the sort of the sadness of vanity. Um, I mean, you're sort of listening to this on record player in suburbia, and you're taken, you know, it's like she takes you by the hand and you fly off through the sky like uh, the snowman or something, or Christmas Carol. He's too busy hitting the Vaseline. I don't know if that's a gay reference or not. It's um, a bit rude. You'd give me a part, my love. But you'd have to play the fool. <laughs> so, of course, she's a gift for satirists. Of course, it's easy. Because dull artists especially in pop music, are very difficult to satirise. It was all there on a plate, really, wasn't it? By running up that road, by running up that hill, no problem, rolling the ball. It's about misinterpreting what she meant, you know.
it's me, oh Cathy, I'm Cathy, I've come home now. So a cold, let me into your window. And he, I think he goes, let me into your window. Whoa. As if it's about, it's sort of cheeky and sexy and not about, you know, the angst of love. Oh, 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 oh. Let me into your window. Oh, oh. Heathcliff. It was fun to do. People laughed. And uh, Kate Bush came to the last night of my show to see it when we performed in the West End. She said, it's so nice to hear all those songs again. That's what she said. <laughs> In early January this year, Kate Bush had never performed before an important live audience. In a sense, she was a media singer. When she took the decision to go on tour, no one doubted how important it could prove to her career. Her early shows were so sensational. The ones she did at the Palladium, for example were the benchmark for people's shows in the future. Orally, she was who she was, but visually, she created a new standard for people. Did you enjoy the show? Oh, it was lovely. Did you? You really happy? I'm knocked out. I can't believe that audience. Now that it has worked so well, I, I gather you're a little bit worried beforehand that it would all be okay. Now that it has proved to be so successful, do you think you might do a more extensive tour later in the year? That really depends. Um, so much depends on energies, you know, mm. because it can become very tiring with the mm. travelling. Mm. Um, I don't know, we have to wait and see. I hope she doesn't mind me saying this, but I, I, um, I went about 14 years ago. I had a long, long phone call with her because I wanted her to do something and she wouldn't, she wouldn't do something live with me or do some song with me. And she rang me to tell me why and it turned into a long, long conversation about performing on stage and how terrifying it can be and how she hadn't done it for a long, long time and she felt a little bit, uh, just a bit scared by, by the prospects of uh, going out there again. I think that her early stuff was her kind of still finding her way. I don't think that she quite found herself. You know, lots of artists need to find their way. And the, all of that early stuff with her dancing around in a leotard. I don't know, it was all a little bit, a, a, a little bit amdram, wasn't it? Some people would have thought, um, you know, it looks like she's come straight out of drama school and she's learned how to kind of wave scarves around and that sort of thing. But to me, it wasn't really about that. It was kind of about the whole package and the sound coming out of her. It was just so incredible. That kind of blew every other, um, you know, um, problem, if you like, away. People didn't really care if she looked a bit naff. She just sounded amazing. Outside. Breathing is a fetal song. It's a song of a reincarnated fetus coming round again, terrified of a nuclear war, terrified of the radioactivity outside, terrified of the idea that we won't be able to breathe. breathe. Nobody writes songs like that. It's, it's utterly political and it's utterly female. Breathe. It's almost like a reminder how important women are. I've, I've had a funny thing, you know, my mother committed suicide and my whole career has been based around my mother. All around my mother because I didn't know her. And you know, just like, um, keep breathing, breathing my mother in. That, that lyric there could be my whole career. And this is what I mean. I'm a kid from a council flat. I'm a mixed race guy who grew up in a white ghetto. Totally different life to Kate Bush. But that lyric, keep breathing my mother in, my whole career is based on that. It 
it was like a little symphony. It, it was, it had the male choir, like this call and response. What are we going to do? And that she's like breathing the way she's singing. I was just like, oh my God, what's this woman on? This is a whole universe I can dive into and for me it was very avant-garde and um, expressive and kind of um, from a complete different planet to everything else that you see from the 80s like you say Duran Duran you know on a boat in Rio <laughs> it's like she was definitely out there on her own. Well, it's funny nobody ever applies the term progressive rock to Kate Bush but to me it's prog you know, it's, it's everything that I love about the best prog. It's like the really sort of brash stuff, which is about people showing technical ability, I have no interest in. But the experimental dreamy stuff that sort of came from lots of different places at once, you know, I sit her stuff next to, well, next to Genesis, the obvious comparison as well, because of her, her story with Peter Gabriel. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Gabriel used a computerized instrument <laughs> called a Fairlight. Any sound can be fed into it, stored, and played back on its keyboard. What was so exciting was that you could take any sound in and then manipulate it. Say, if I pick up this mic, for an example, and uh, press S for sample, we can put in the sound, I hope. Over here we have the waveform and it should be up on the keyboard. Every kid can do that with their phone nowadays, but at the time it was absolutely unique and suddenly opened up these whole sort of continents of new sound texture. <laughs> Well, she did give me a credit on one record for opening her windows. I had actually cleaned the windows, but I, I'm very happy to uh, get any acknowledgement. She wanted to test her husband. She knew exactly what to do. A pseudonym to fool him. She couldn't have made a worst move. She sent him sensitive letters, and he received them. The video is so kind of classic Kate Bush because she does this thing whenever she's performing which is that she's one version of herself and then often when the chorus kicks in she becomes this other version which is a kind of crazier version and her eyes get very wide and you know the camera zooms in and she's sort of performing this kind of crazy unhinged woman and that's clearly inside her that she brings out in these songs Babushka is one of those songs you just can't get out of your head can you you know how she is able to take a word and then you start seeing images and pictures to a word that maybe you haven't used. It's not as if you're saying, um, je t'aime. It's babushka. And how she's turned that into, though, an emotion, that's just how she's able to use um, a combination of a word and a combination of a melody and the rhythm of that. And it creates a new language. She wanted to take it further, so she arranged a place to go. The first song I heard was Babushka, and like, you know, with the bass and this amazing relationship she had with that bass. No one had done anything like that before, and like, this, the, the dance moves that she were doing were not things that you would learn in a dance academy and like the music was not something you'd learn in a kind of rock school or a conservatoire of music academy. What I love about her music is that it's so innate. The talent she has is so innate but perfect 
fully formed music. I read an interview with her one time where she was asked something along the lines of, why do you write from the perspective of a lot of characters? And she said very simply and eloquently, because they're more interesting than I am. She seems to have an endless kind of ability to put herself in and empathize with different characters and viewpoints. Army Dreamers is a maternal point of view. It's, it's, it, you know, you've got this song about young squaddies dying and the person singing it, you know, somewhere understands what it's like to be a mother and to lose a son. Byron once said of Keats, Keats writes about what he imagines. I write about what I live. And most rock and roll people uh, write about their lives in some way. And um, Kate Bush is, is more like Keats in that she writes about what she imagines. I see the people working and see it working for them. My favourite album by her is uh, the, the Dreaming, and I think she produced that one herself. And that got a lot of criticism, but I loved it. It was overloaded with textures and tones and all manner of things. It's a record that is, I still can play to this day and still hear new things. I mean, obviously, it's not number one on the dance floor, but then all music shouldn't be. Well, seemingly, it's you <laughs> holding onto some bloke's ears. There's something in your mouth. It looks like a... Is it a key? Yeah. It's a key! It's a key. Uh -huh. Well, if you listen to the album, and especially to the song Houdini, then you'll ah. know all about it. <laughs> Well, it's with the kiss I'd pass the key. Do you know who the man is that she's kissing? It's me. Yeah. You can only see my my right ear, but then again, who wants to see me? Kate has spent the last 14 months holed up in various studios recording her new LP, The Dreaming, and the resultant noises include helicopter rotor blades, didgeridoos, and a chorus of fake sheep. <laughs> That on that track you employed, I think, Percy Edwards to supply the kind of synthesised jungle backing. Yes. Well, um, I knew that in the choruses we wanted to create a, a feeling of the landscape, and obviously there are a lot of Australian animals, and mm. the sounds are very reminiscent of the environment. And of course, Percy could come along and give us a selection of at least ten different Australian animals. <laughs> I'm not sure which song is the one where she's like donkey braying. <laughs> That's one where she's like. <laughs> when I first heard it, I almost had to bend my ears round to to be able to un understand the sounds that were coming at me. And I found it really, again, I was like 11 or 12, so I found some of it really scary. I must admit, just when I think I'm the direction I'm going in with my art is the way I want to go, because for me, it's, it's a little bit deeper, it's got more meaning, it's, um, it's not so poppy, I suppose. But of course, um, maybe that won't be so widely accepted, especially in the singles chart. We got the job she came out with this record that people were just like what you know they couldn't grasp it and 
But the greatest thing that happened was after that, The Hands of Love, I think, which is one of the Hermes complete works, was created. And I think only through pushing through those boundaries and exploring the deepest recesses of production could she can then come through and create something like The Hands of Love. You went away on your own terms to make this LP, didn't you? Yes, I, I wanted to make sure that uh, we got our own studio together. That was the next move, really. I spent a lot of time on the last album, moving from studio to studio. And uh, now we've got our own place and everything is brilliant. It makes such a difference. When we set up the, the mastering studio for Hounds of Love, I, I think that really did uh, to get rid of the last of the chains that she had, that she felt she had. And it did set her free in a lot of ways. Now, though, a timely burst from a lady who hasn't graced the turntables with a new record for two years. It's nice to have her back. I just remember pulling aside. I was driving, and I heard it on the radio in the States. And she didn't get played a lot on the radio in the States until that song. That really got played a lot. It doesn't hurt me. I remember I had to pull over and listen to it because I, I never heard anything like it. I think the choreography, the fact that there was suddenly a Kate Bush who was completely owning, you know, the the aspect of, of dance even not singing, even not, you know, she wasn't even lip syncing, she was just dancing. On top of that, it was a way of dancing that was, at the time, uh, not at all popular. Uh, it wasn't the type of dancing that you would have from, I don't know, artists like Michael Jackson or Janet Jackson or Madonna. You had somebody who was bringing in a style of dancing that was like a marginal way of moving, a modern dance. This is like one of my all-time favorite songs, too. Music is supposed to evoke emotion, you know what I'm saying? It makes you feel a certain way, you know? Just, that's, that's what the vibrations are. It's, it's, it's not stagnant, it's not just plain or whatever. Every time you listen to it, it just touches you, strikes a chord. I was introduced to the music by my Uncle Russell, and he's kind of like a weirdo. Like other uh, family, you know, was a skateboarder and all kind of things. So I was like, you know, sixth, seventh grade, and I used to ride my bike to school and just listen to it. And then I just got deeper and deeper into it. That's, you know, one of my biggest musical influences. I, I love it. If you look at her work from the kick inside and how it evolves through things like Never Forever and stuff like that into you know, the, the zenith, which is Hounds of Love for me, you know. It's just, it's a beautiful evolution, and the, the, the songs are kind of, kind of becoming more sophisticated, even though they've always been sophisticated, even from the start. They're, kind of, they're just developing a kind, of, a kind of calm sophistication. And I think she just always kept people guessing. Now here with the title track of her best-selling LP in the studio at number 18, Kate Bush with the Hounds of Love. In the trees. Coming. When I was a child, running in the night, afraid of what I might not be, hiding in the dark, hiding in the sky. She starts the song with a quote from Night of the Demon, and it's a little bit scary. The hounds of love are haunting. I've always been the cow. It's like this repressed sexuality, so sensual and sexual, and it's so honest as well. I'm a coward and I'm frightened. You know, to state I'm a coward in a song is quite a brave thing to do, actually. It is like she's on a leash. It's like the whole song's on a leash, and you're tugging it back, but you know it's just gonna escape and burst and run free. I'm convinced that as great as that record sounds, if you had anyone else sing it, you know, anyone else try to kind of weave and, 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 and make it kind of do that thing where it burns like wildfire and it comes alive, no one else could do it. 
it's incredible the way she brings this kind of cold arctic atmosphere it's just like fire you know it's all just like ugh, coming out of her mouth everything's doubling up now you've got twice the amount of cellos so everything's doubled Fairlight synthesizer, and there's the wash, which is what she wrote the song with. What we've done is we'd set up a, I'd set up a pattern in the Fairlight page R, put that to tape, so she had that pattern to play along with, and then she used the, the Orchestra Five sound as a wash to, to actually write the song with, which is what you hear all the way through. It's that kind of washy uh, synthesizer sound that's underneath it all, and then all the cellos just dance over the top of it. Virtually no backing vocals at all. The I think that's the strength of the song, is the fact that it's very little to get in the way of that lead vocal. And now I'm just playing the song in my head. She's like, do you know what I really need? Do you know what I really need? The la 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 la, yeah, yo, yeah, yo, yo, love. I find it really hard to, to, to separate images from the music once you know the music's brilliant. And of course, I associate this image with some of my favourite songs um, that I know in my life. Little light, shiny. The second half of The Hounds of Love is that's really where the magic is for me. When I mean, the first half is a collection of the singles almost, isn't it? But the second half is an incredible sort of series of songs and Dream of Sheep, which is so beautiful. I tune into some friendly voices talking about stupid things. I tune into some friendly voices talking about stupid things. I can't be left to my imagination. Let me weak, let me be sleep, let me sleep and dream of sheep. That the way it kind of goes into other the stranger songs like Waking the Witch and things like that, where it's just it's just it's just these odd little uncomfortable little musical moments. I think the ninth wave was the piece of music that affected me the most when I was little because it terrified me. It's about witches and being stuck under ice and, you know, floating adrift in a sea of nothingness and all those kind of dream elements, subconscious themes and very kind of English, ancient storytelling. It seems like on that piece of music she captured that moment between waking and sleeping. I've spent many, many, many hours listening to that, th th that 30 minutes of music. It's, it's an incredible piece of music, and I advise anyone that has, has, has never heard it to go and, to go and listen to it, because it's one of the great pieces of music. Creativity comes from the freedom to fail, and the freedom to fail comes from, you know, experimentation, and that's what gives something its individuality. And, you know, I think her courage and... Um, which is the positive way of interpreting it, or bloody-mindedness, which is the negative, is part of what gives her real value as an artist. In this proud land we grew up strong We were wanted all along I was taught to fight, taught to win I never thought... It's extraordinary what that song has been used for, but I think a lot of people that have got into trouble have attached themselves to that song. And I think a lot of it is that Kate's, you know, wonderful voice is there in a sort of reassuring and loving way and just makes them think that perhaps there's going to be that type of love out there for them. Don't give up cause you have The record she did with Peter Gabriel was one record that saved my life. That record helped me get sober. Um, so she played a big part in my actual downfall and 
kind of um, rebirth, as it were. That record helped me so many, so much. Um, I never told her that, but it did. One of the things that I love about Kate Bush is her absolute ability to take things, to pluck things that you would never expect to see on a rock album and put them there and make them work. James Joyce's Ulysses, one of the, the, the greatest passages in all of English or Anglo-Irish literature um, is Molly Bloom's glorious soliloquy ending in a sequence of yeses. Yes, he said, I was a flower of the mountain, yes. So we're all flowers of woman's body, yes. About embracing the world of the senses, embracing yourself, embracing sex, embracing love, embracing the future, embracing all possibility. And it goes all the way back for me to Wuthering Heights. This is somebody who's not afraid of books. This is somebody who's not afraid of reading, somebody who's not afraid of writers, and who's not afraid of translating, being an intermediary, being a door between the world of books and the world of rock. I still remember going to the CD store and buying Central World when I was 16. And the cover, and there's a rose in front of her mouth that has bloomed. She's got big wide eyes. And I remember, you know, putting it in the shitty car stereo on the way home. And, you know, and my life was forever changed. I really thank Kate because these touchstones like this woman's work, that kind of song is um, it's celebrating everything that's so wonderful about being a woman and being nurturing and intuitive and emotional and gentle and sensual and just like really intimate. I should be crying but I just can't live it sure. People don't put their hearts on the line in that vulnerable way very much and it's really as an artist myself, it's helped me to not be frightened to show all as much of my vulnerability as a, as a woman as I can and in that be powerful. It's as if within her voice there's there's everything, every possible facet of human experience is there under her surface and her work as a writer is to constantly draw that out. And not, not just the particularity of her experience as a female body, but her experience as a person, which is to be prey to all kinds of forces and sensations. <laughs> What about lyrics? Yours are very passionate and, and provocative. Um, do you get inspiration anywhere? Um, I think it is elusive stuff, but I think really the biggest inspiration is people. I think uh, people are, are just so inspiring. They're fascinating and wonderful. And I, I think you know that nearly every idea that a person has had has probably at some point come from another person. I think the Red Shoes, without going into too much detail, is a very personal album. You know, there was, there was a lot of very personal stuff happening at that time. And I think it, it shows in the music. I mean, that basically, a lot of the music on the album is about breakup of relationships. You know, I'll come around when you're not in and I'll pick up all my things, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's all right, I'll come around when you're not in And I'll pick up all my things Everything I have I bought with you it's such a it's such a desperate song. I mean, she really finds a way to to convey 
uh, despair, the despair of uh, you know missing uh, the person or, or a breakup that that you know will never come back together again. I don't quite know how to put this, but obviously you know you you've had a professional and personal relationship with Kate for a long time, um, and there was and, and the red shoes was. Uh, an expression of, of some of the things that may have been happening between the two of you and yet you were still working together. That's exactly it. Well, because the re working relationship was never a problem. You know, we always work together reasonably well, you know. We always argue, we always have and always will, you know, I guess. I've, I've, I've always argued with Kate, she's always argued with me, but I guess that's, that's the way it is, you know. So I, I feel I'm emotionally involved with it all to a great extent, you know much more so than most people would imagine. You know, not only did we have a personal relationship and I work with her, I really love her music, I really do. You know, to the point where I've virtually worked with nobody else because nobody else comes close. Some moments that I've had Some moments of pleasure I was just really sad that suddenly someone who who was making work that that was accessible to me suddenly became inaccessible because you know because of circumstances personal choices or whatever but but I always blamed the critics <laughs> and I can hear my mother saying, every old sock meets an old shoe and that a great sin The fact that she took time off to raise her child and disappear and, and give Bertie a wonderful life, the humanity in her is so great, and she wasn't interested in anything except, you know, raising her child and being happy. And I don't think what Kate Bush did was like a weird thing at all to kind of withdraw uh, to bring up a child, if, if, if that's indeed why she did withdraw. Maybe she just withdrew because she was sick of the whole bloody lot of them wanting to know about her life. And I could really understand that. For me to, to get into that creative process, I have to have a sort of quiet place that I work from. And if I was living the life of an, you know, somebody in the industry as a pop star or whatever, it's too distracting. It's too to do with other people's perceptions of who you are. And what's important to me is to be a human being who has a soul and who hopefully has a sense of who they are, not who everybody else thinks you are. John Harris, there's been some anticipation over this. Someone even wrote a novel called Waiting for Kate Bush um, about the long wait. Uh, has it been worth it? Well, I think there's probably less anticipation in the real world, in quote marks, than there is in certain circles of the media. I think people get themselves in a right old tiz about this record. Because there's still an element of we are not worthy about Kate Bush. But deeply eccentric. Well, it's not, it, it, it's but... not actually, that's the point, it's not eccentric. And you can tell this is, this is someone who's not been near the music business for 12 years. And it sounds like the sort of thing that would blast from shopping malls in about 1989. There's a bit of kind of tears well, for no, fears no, about it. it. What I like is it's not self-conscious eccentricity. I think she's making this record for herself. She's pleasing herself with her music. The um, Ariel album. My favourite on that album is actually that song called Prelude. It's just the sound of some cuckoos and the sound of a child's voice and she just manages to combine these very very prosaic pure elements and turn them into magic she's always been able to find let's say the language of nature she would be able to to make you hear words within uh, you know uh, the, the the sounds that birds would make you would actually hear that they're saying something 
Kate Bush makes a record, then you don't hear from her. And you play the stuff that she's made already and you listen to it. And one day you are surprised and she brings out something else and she's been quietly working away on it for however long she wanted to work on it. And I love that. I love the, the willingness to be quiet until it's time to speak, which is something that she does over and over. No, my favourite track on that is where her little son, he sings, I am Sky, you know, that amazing, like, choral boy, pure voice was like, it's just so lovely to hear the generations coming through and that they're making music together. I am Sky. I was called by my agent, who said, um, would you like to record a track with Kate Bush? To which there is only ever one possible answer, as long as it's not me singing. I said, she does know I can't sing. She said, no, 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 it, it would be voicing, um, uh, saying, saying words for snow. Oh, no, it's not you. I just still can't quite believe it says, Kate Bush stroked Stephen Fry. <laughs> Wonderfully atmospheric, isn't it? Just something about it. Phrases and epithets are hers, and they're not. Some of them obviously exist, like white out, and, and some of them are just sort of poetic, forced poetic. I mean, almost like what Anglo-Saxon poetry is known as a kenning, where you just um, put things together. She has a very intense poetic mind. Hooded wet. That's what makes it. That voice that comes in. intention is to tell a story, to create a sonic world for us, a sonic painting for us to walk into without having to um, see her. She's transcending that. She's choosing to transcend that and that's a very powerful thing to do. You don't ever get the sense that she is making music to pander to anyone. I think you always get her absolute best attempt at her true vision whenever you get a Kate Bush record. The words coming to my mind is national treasure, but that means like kind of like an almost dead person, doesn't it, or something. She's become a legend, not just because she's been absent, but because she's important to musicians as much as she's important to the British public. She's one of those people that has got the muse over their head. She's got this special way to tap in to the energy and reality of music. She takes you somewhere else. You know, there are other artists that are of a genre, aren't they? And you can sort of jump between them. I don't think you can do that with her. I think you have to fully submerge yourself in, I was going to say the bush, but I, I, I better not.
And now making her debut on Top of the Pops is the exquisite Kate Bush with her new single, Wuthering Heights.
incredible, she's charming, she's Kate Bush! And whose looks are amazing? Whose voice is amazing? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a tree? No, 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 it's a bush. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Kate Bush.
Running up that hill, it's Kate Bush.
Now here with the title track of her best-selling OP in the studio at number 18, Kate Bush with the Hounds of Love.
Talented songwriter, singer whose quality has stood the test of time from her platinum album, The Sensual World, This Woman's Work. Welcome, Kate Bush.
Life is sad 